LinkedIn presents. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Teresa Worthy about leveraging self-awareness to create and maintain a culture of inclusivity and belonging. Teresa Worthy, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you for having me. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from the Atlanta area. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about leveraging self-awareness to create and maintain a culture of inclusivity and belonging. Now, DEI efforts, of course, are something that gets a lot of attention nowadays, especially in the wake of the George Floyd moment uh, and and some of the other social and political up heavals in recent years. I'm intrigued by your focus on fostering and and, uh, cultivating self-awareness as a critical approach as we're trying to improve our diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging efforts individually and within our teams and organizations. So that's what we'll be exploring together today. As we get started, I wanted to share Teresa's bio with everybody. Teresa Worthy is an accomplished educator, author, consultant, and speaker with over a decade of experience in the educational and personal development industries, drawing on the insights from her personal independent study of over 2,000 participants across America from every demographic. She has become an expert in self-awareness. She believes that self-aware leaders have the advantage in creating and maintaining a culture of inclusivity and belonging. I think that's fantastic. I'm, I'm thrilled to have the chance to chat with you. Anything else you would like to share with me or my audience by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in? That's good. That's that's sufficient. Thank you. Okay, cool. Well, let's start with a little bit of your background. I know you you had uh, a good part of your career as a teacher, um, you've moved into professional speaking and consulting. Um, tell us a little bit about that career transition uh, from being a French teacher to moving into those other spaces and why you honed in on and focused on self-awareness, emotional intelligence, and inclusion. The transition was prompted by my retirement from education or from the teaching area. And once I retired, I realized that I was just not ready to sit on the porch in a rocking chair. So I started um, my social outreach, or what I thought would be social outreach, by joining Toastmasters International. But once I got in that uh, organization or in my local club, I realized that that organization is about teaching, one, how to become a more effective public speaker, and it teaches leadership skills. So I stayed there, uh, and I'm still a member And I gained the highest level that you can achieve, and that's of the Distinguished Toastmaster. Once I reached that level, and during the time I was there, I was also writing a book. Once I completed that book, I decided to uh, begin my own self-publishing company that's called TSW Wordsmith, LLC. Once I did that, I started coming into contact with people who were aspiring writers who wanted to write and had no idea of what to do. So I began to hold workshops and sessions to teach them how to write their books all the way up to publishing. 
And that led me to joining the National Speakers Association. And that association differs greatly from Toastmasters in that it teaches you how to, as you say, hone in on a topic and let that topic become your your message or your brand message, if you will. What led me to inclusion initially is the fact that I grew up in the segregated South and I have always been passionate about Uh, And at the time, we called it integration. Integration is a synonym for inclusion. But I've always been passionate about being allowed to exist in this country on a fair and equal basis, regardless of my difference. So once I realized that there was an opportunity to bring that message to audiences, I thought that it would probably be a little bit better if I gained a little bit more education, because I am a lifelong learner. So that's when I entered uh, Cornell University's program on diversity and inclusion and gained certification in that area. Once I began working with it, I began to notice that a lot of DEI experts focus on things like metrics. And I am aware that there are more systemic issues with the DEI um, issue. Things like structural inequity, unconscious bias, and um, the fact that not everybody is represented in the leadership area. So when I looked at that and I read a book or read an article where a person said that 100% of people, when asked, do you know who you are, will answer yes, but only 15% of them actually do. That's what research shows. So knowing who you are is self-awareness. So the next question to hit, hit me was, how can a person effectively lead inclusion initiatives if they don't really understand who they are to begin with? So that's how I headed out into that direction of self-awareness. And then once I realized that self-awareness means being cognizant or aware of recognizing and identifying your feelings, your thoughts, and your behaviors, feelings jumped out at me because we have a tendency to use feelings and emotions interchangeably, but they have two different definitions. Feelings are conscious. We're always conscious of our feelings. But emotions can be conscious and subconscious. And here's the key point here. That's those subconscious emotions guide our behavior in most instances. And most people aren't aware of that. So then I thought, well, an inclusive leader then would need to be self-aware and definitely emotionally intelligent. So That's how I came to that space. Uh, Of course, it it involved more study and gaining certifications, but that's how I got there because I I wanted to have a different approach because I know uh, organizations are tired of being beat over the head with inclusion and diversity is the right thing to do. I feel like more they would be more receptive to it if they understood why they, as an individual, have an impact on other people. And the only way to understand that is to become more self-aware and more emotionally intelligent. Yeah, yeah, well said. And it's interesting to to hear about your journey, um, a a successful career as a teacher, an educator, and then moving into the space in retirement, really a second career. And I think that in and of itself is a good reminder and a good message to all of us uh, that Perhaps how we used to think about the labor force and how we used to think about, um, you know, our years in the labor force and what our careers might look like, um, that has changed a lot for a lot of people. And there are many individuals who are doing just like you have done uh, where they, they move into second careers or third careers where, where they, they pivot out of maybe something they've done really well and that they really enjoyed for a really long time, uh, but they're not ready to just hang up their hat and, and, 
you know, play golf every day or sit on the front porch, as you said, uh, they still want to make a difference, want to make a contribution and they're lifelong learners and they're ready to retool and, and reskill and ready to share their life's experiences and wisdom with those around them. Uh, and, th- and that's what you've done. And I think that's tremendous. And in an, a rec, uh, an awareness in our, in the, a willingness to retool, um, when, you get to that space, you know, that's something a lot of people wouldn't be willing to do uh, as they get a little bit older and think, yeah, I, I did that when I was younger. I don't really want to bother with it anymore. Um, so I really like that about your, your experience, your journey, as you explained it. Um, I would also, I'd love to hear more about your self study, your personal independent study of over 2000 participants. Um, that's, that's interesting and a unique kind of a thing for someone to just choose to do on their own when you don't come from, you know, an academic kind of a background where you conduct research. Tell us more about that, why you decided to do that, uh, how you designed that study, and maybe some of the key findings that you uh, discovered as you went about that study. It goes back to that article that I read, because the author of the article, after giving us that statistic about only 15 percent being self-aware, truly being self-aware, I, I you know, my first uh, instinct was to think, my goodness, I don't think that's true. And then I wondered, where am I? Am I, if it is true, am I part of the 15 percent or am I a part of the 85 percent? And how can I know for sure, you know, that this is true? Is there a way that I can find out for myself if this is true? So I let that simmer. And then it occurred to me one day that I could do my own study. So I came up with three questions that I would ask people during my um, sessions, during workshop sessions, during virtual um, attendance to different webinars myself, as I met people in networking events, as I attended social events, as I attended sporting events, as I traveled, anywhere I came into contact with other people and had the opportunity to talk to them, I'd ask these three questions. The first one was, do you know who you are? The second one was, do other people know the same you that you know? And the third one was, do you have a sense of belonging and inclusion in your home, at school, at work, in a club, in a social organization, wherever you go out and, and, and put, and, and, you know, and put yourself in social settings? Do you have a sense of belonging or inclusion? And what I learned, I found that the writer of that article was was exactly on point. Most of the people would would begin by saying, giving me a definite, yes, I know who I am. But then they would follow it up with something like, but of course, you know, it depends on who I'm with at the time. And of course, that was my segue into, well, do other people know who you are? Know the same you that you know. And they would follow that with, well, I usually, I am able to be whoever I need to be, depending on where I am. And then I'd follow that with, well, is that necessary because, or do you feel a sense of belonging or inclusion with whomever you are with or wherever you are? And of course, that would be followed by most of the time, over 50% of the time, with a resounding no. I don't feel a sense of belonging and inclusion. That's super interesting. And and I like how you just proactively made it a part of your daily experience as you went about your work and interacted with people all around you. Um, that That's a really fun way and a fun approach to doing something that, you know, I, I'm in an academic space. So I, you know, my initial thought was you were going to explain, you know, how you put together a survey and distributed it and analyzed the data and everything. What you just described is a little bit more of an informal approach, uh, more of a, a, a qualitative approach, but uh, something that I think is incredibly valuable to influence your thinking and to help you understand 
how uh, others are viewing themselves in relation to their self-awareness and their emotional intelligence. So I think that's really interesting. And it's, it's, it's easy. Like it's something simple that all of us could do in our work. Uh, if we're just a little bit proactive and thoughtful about how we're interacting with those around us. Um, if we could drill down a little bit more around self-awareness and emotional intelligence, uh, you've already, you know, referred to your interest in those areas and a little bit about why they're important, but maybe, drill down a little bit more explicitly about why they're so important in the workplace and what that means for creating that culture of inclusivity and belonging in the workplace. Okay. Well, as you know, most workplaces, um, it's obvious the unthinkable continues. Most Americans know something very wrong is happening. People in charge keep telling you that everything's fine and to stop noticing, but you know better. That's why self-reliant folks are investing in emergency food storage. And you should, too. My Patriot Supply, the nation's largest emergency preparedness company, are the ones you can trust. Go to MyPatriotSupply.com and secure their best-selling three-month emergency food kits. Each contains tasty breakfasts, lunches, and dinners, averaging over 2,000 calories per day. Save $200 on each three-month food kit you purchase. My Patriot Supply also sells solar generators, gravity-powered water filters, off-grid room heaters for when the power goes out, heirloom seeds, and survival gear. Order by 3 p.m. and your items ship that same day and arrive quickly on your doorstep in unmarked boxes. Go to MyPatriotSupply.com today. Time is running out to prepare for what's coming. MyPatriotSupply.com have people in them they're people working and that's what where the culture is because when we use culture when we're talking about corporate or workplace culture we mean the people who work there and so all of these people have the ability to co-create that culture and in co-creating that culture they do so through their self-awareness skills, their emotional intelligence skills, and their inclusive behavior. When a person is self-aware, they know their strengths and weaknesses. They know their values. They know what motivates them. They also understand that their thoughts and behaviors and, and feelings have an effect or an impact on their relationships with others. And in going about carrying out the goals of an organization, it's it's a requirement to have a relationship with others. It's also a requirement to be able to collaborate with others. It's also, in the case of leaders, it's also a requirement to be able to lead effectively. There's also cases where conflict resolution comes into play. And all of these things in a workplace can clog the machinery, if you will. It can keep the actual members or team uh, teams in that workplace from accomplishing the goals of the organization. And that's what organizations want to do in order to be profitable and have a sustainable growth. They want to achieve their goals. And so it's important then for every individual within that workplace to become aware of their thoughts and feelings and their behaviors and how they impact others so that they can form better relationships, so that they can make better decisions, so that they can be proactive and engaged in the work, and so that they can open their their innate open the way to their innate creativity and come up with innovative ideas. So that's why it's important in the workplace. No, I agree. I, th- I think it's it's compelling. There, there are so many important reasons why self-awareness helps us to be a better leader, why emotional intelligence it helps us to be a better leader. And in fact, I don't think we can have emotional intelligence or have a high EQ unless we start with self-awareness. You kind of referred to that earlier. It starts with knowing who you are, truly understanding that, not just what you project out to the world, not just what the world tells you you're supposed to be, but no, who, who are you really? What are your motivations? Uh, what are your desired actions uh, and the why behind what you do? Um, how do you, how are you 
interacting with those around you? How do you be with people uh, when you're working collaboratively, et cetera? All these different elements that if we take some time to pause and think and, and practice self-reflection and, and increase our self-awareness, it will in turn help us to better understand the interactions we have with other people, recognizing that they're struggling with the same kinds of self-awareness issues that we are struggling with. We're all kind of muddling through this together. Um, we can start to better understand where they might be coming from and have a little bit more compassion and empathy for where they might be coming from um, because we understand ourselves better. Uh, so it's a, it's a reciprocal process. We, we can enhance our ability and it's a, a critical um, durable leadership skill that every leader needs to develop. And in relation to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, I'm not sure you can get to a place of true inclusivity and belonging, having that kind of a culture, uh, unless you can critically self-reflect on your own upbringing, your own biases, uh, and other things like that. Uh, we all have them. We all have different things that are just kind of ingrained deep in our psyche that we're not even fully aware of that can manifest in a variety of ways. And unless we practice self-reflection and, and self-awareness, we're never going to tr- understand those things. And so we're not going to be able to see them as they're happening. We're not going to understand why we're doing what we're doing or even notice what we're doing that might be hurting those around us. Uh, so for all of those reasons, I think uh, it's a tremendously important. Um, in all of the work that you do in this space, are, are there some common misconceptions that you see people have uh, perpetually about self-awareness, emotional intelligence, inclusion, uh, et cetera? And if there are common misconceptions, how can we go about overcoming those? Yeah. Yes, there are several misconceptions. Um, one of them is that self-awareness is just introspection. You know, you just sort of look inside or look inward and then you get to know yourself. But that's not all. Self-awareness has two parts. It has inward and outward. Outward is where you get feedback from others. You know, you ask people that you trust. What do you think about my behavior today or just a few minutes ago? Or what do you think about my thoughts on this? Or what do you think about how I've been, you know, my how my feelings have consistently cropped up in our conversation? So that helps a person or an individual to see or have a perspective from someone who is on the outside looking at them. Because I like to liken um, outward self-reflection to looking in a prism. You know, when you when a light goes through a prism, it comes out reflecting lots of different colors. And when we get feedback from different people, we come back with lots of different perspectives. Sometimes they're beautiful and sometimes they're not so much so, but at least we are aware of them. And if we're willing then we can make changes to improve what we hear or the feedback that we get from others. And so um, that's uh, one misconception. Another one is that people think that diversity is just inclusion when it's not. Diversity is simply means variety. Simply put, it just means variety. It is a variety of people from different backgrounds, different education, educational uh, experiences, different faith, different everything. And that's diversity. Inclusion, on the other hand, is where all of these diverse people can experience a sense of belonging despite those differences. Another misconception is that emotional intelligence has no place in the workplace. A lot of people think that, you know, emotional intelligence just means being nice. And as long as I'm nice, then I'm emotionally intelligent. <laughs> but but sometimes being emotional intelligent emotionally intelligent means that you have to be assertive. And sometimes being assertive isn't considered being nice. But there are ways to be positively assertive. There are also ways to be positively angry, if you will. It just means that it only occurs with someone who is a highly emotionally intelligent. So those are just three of the misconceptions. How I help people overcome them, of course, is through 
my training programs, because during my training, you learn the importance and how to become more self-aware. You realize that your thoughts, your feelings, and your behaviors impact other people. But if you're aware of the of that, and you're willing to not impact people negatively, you can make changes. It's only when you're unaware of things that you can't change anything. With emotional intelligence, emotional intelligence allows us to recognize and identify our emotions and then use that information to change our behavior toward other people. And so that's that's what's so key about emotional intelligence and self-awareness. And then inclusive behaviors, of course, are almost an, an, a natural uh, offspring of being emotionally intelligent and self-aware because we begin to realize that I'm a person, you're a person, you have a right to be angry, I have a right to be angry, you have a right to be happy, et cetera, et cetera. You have a right to behave as you do. And because I'm so self-aware and emotionally intelligent, I understand why you're behaving that way. I see where you're coming from. And rather than respond or react to you in a negative manner, I come to you in a more positive manner so that we can reach what I like to call transformational relationships. Yeah, I love it. Teresa, this has just been a really great conversation. I know at the time I'm going to have to let you go here in just a minute, but before we wrap things up, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Okay. Well, I'm on LinkedIn for those of you who are on LinkedIn. I'm on uh, Instagram at Worthy of Inclusion. Uh, I'm also on Facebook, just simply as Teresa Worthy. And I have a website, uh, TeresaWorthy.com, which is under construction now. But I also have a website for my business, which is TSWWordsmith.com. So that's how one can reach me. Just Wonderful. Well, Teresa, this has just been a great conversation. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you sharing your insights with me and the audience. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Teresa can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. You enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page. And please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week. Ew, gotta get rid of this old Backstreet Boys t-shirt. Tell me why. Because it stinks, boys. Tell me why. I've washed it so many times, but the odor won't come out. Tell me why. No, you tell me why I can't get rid of this odor. Have you tried Downy Rinse and Refresh? It doesn't just cover up odors. It helps remove them. Wow, it worked, guys. Yeah. Downy Rinse and Refresh removes more odor in one wash than the leading value detergent in three washes. Find it wherever you buy laundry products.